got weeds in their crops at harvest? Put your hand up. Nice and high, everyone. Yep, what weeds? Main weeds, what are you finding? Uh, ryegrass. Is ryegrass everyone's main weed? Yep, yep. And who's got resistance that they know about? Getting there. Hand up. Has anyone tested out of interest? No, no. Um, yeah, resistance testing is yeah definitely a sort of useful strategy to see um, yeah what sort of issues you're, you're dealing with. But we probably do know um, yeah it, it's sort of everywhere. And what about glyphosate resistance? Is anyone finding that's increasing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess we know like generally weeds will get through. Um, all of your tools and, and at harvest time there's um, enough in crops sort of to deal with. Um, a good thing to do is sort of just consider um, why the weeds are there in the first place and I guess at Weed Smart we sort of um, look at all the strategies that we can utilise um, for your whole, your, your whole cropping program to um, deal with weeds in, in more than just one strategy. So in your little brochure we talk a lot about the big six. So um, six integrated weed management strategies um, that you can adopt um, on farm and, and it's sort of about not just relying on, on one thing. We're going to talk about harvest weed seed control here which is just one really great tool um, that looks at capturing the weeds during harvest and, and doing something with them but you need to sort of be thinking about why they're there in the first place at harvest and what we can do to adjust our program um, to use more than one tool. Um, to deal with weeds. So there has been um, a few projects sort of done in the high rainfall region um, looking at ryegrass management, what strategies are going to work best and, um, and all of them really is the answer but probably um, from yeah sort of reading some of the stuff and, and catching up with some of the key researchers that, that did do that work probably crop rotation, double breaks, mixing and rotating herbicides and crop competition are sort of the, the key ones um, for keeping ryegrass numbers down in the high rainfall zone because I guess you all know that, that blowouts when they do happen can be significant and we sort of we can't just be relying on, on mixing and rotate, rotating herbicides to do that. Crop competition is, is key and, and having a sustainable rotation um, that allows us to use all of these, these six tools. Um, so I guess right at the end of the season, um, harvest weed seed control is about um, capturing the seeds um, at harvest time and doing something with them at, out the back of the header. So um, I guess um, you'll see here um, there's sort of six different tools um, we can look at. Chaff lining, so just the chaff section and, and um, dropping it into a really narrow band um, and letting it, letting it rot. Um, a bit of breakdown from predation or, or, or using a different strategy to, to deal with the germinating weeds that come up in the chaff line. Um, chaff decking is similar but you're splitting it into two sec you're splitting the chaff into two sections and normally in, in a controlled traffic situation um, you're putting it back on the, the tram lines um, and you're sort of suppressing weeds that, that are in the um, tram lines which is a bit of a sort of hostile environment and whether you do deal with the, the weeds um, that come up there. Um, chaff carts, so anyone got a chaff cart? See anyone in this part of the world? Um, yeah, so obviously collecting um, the chaff material and, and dropping it at the end of the paddocks um, with the chaff cart and whether you're burning the heaps or, or baling, using it for livestock feed um, is the strategy there. Um, the fourth one that just looks at the chaff component is the seed impact mills um, fitted to the back of the header um, and the two that use um, the chaff and the straw material is um, a narrow windrow burning so dropping it in um, a narrow windrow and then, and then burn, burning it or um, bale direct is the other one which is um, a, a baler attached to the, the back of the header and, and um, collecting it all in those ways. So um, each of those sort of six strategies, pros and cons, um, different costs associated with them per hectare. On the Weed Smart um, website there's a really good calculator for looking at the cost of each of those six um, tools for dealing with weed seeds, weed seeds at harvest. Um, 
And yeah, I probably encourage you to, to go have a look at it um, and have a look at the Weed Smart website too um, for all of those tools um, as well. I'm probably keen to get someone um, just to run through the impact mills, just how they work a bit. Um, I guess separating the, the straw and the chaff and how the mills actually kill weed, weed seeds. There was a few people here that do have impact mills. Hands up. One, two, was it just, uh, yep, you as well. Um, and we'll get you to talk about them and, and pros and cons. Um, and yeah, I guess the benefit of any harvest weed seed control system um, is dealing with the weeds that come through the header. Um, and we know we're not gonna get all, all weeds that come through or all weeds um, that might be in the paddock at harvest time, but all the percentages do certainly add up. Um, and yeah, I'm keen to hear from you guys about, about your experience um, as well. Effectively, effectively, the impact mill is exactly that. It's, um, it's basically accelerating the, the residue um, and then stopping it stone dead. Okay, so basically the impact mills all work pretty much the same. Um, they're all running at around about the same speed, around about that 3,000 RPM. They're gathering the seed, throwing it at a stationary uh, element, and then accelerate it and throw it at another stationary element. Um, the only variation to that, obviously, is the way that they look, the way that they integrate, um, and the additional feature that Seed Terminator has that the others don't, and that is that it is a impact, it is an impact mill, but it is a, a hammer mill as well, and it has a, a, a movable flail. So that's probably the only major difference, okay? Um, there's been a whole pile of research done recently. Let's, let's wait and see what the results of those kill rates are. What's the difference with uh, having a flail mill versus a convenient over here? So the advantage of the flail, and look, I've got to take my seed terminator hat off because I don't wear that anymore, but after working with them for the last five years, got a pretty clear understanding. Of them. The flail itself is doing two things. It's generating airflow. So it'll, it'll create the same amount of airflow that one of these harvesters with the fan at max RPM will generate. So there's no pressure differential. So that's the primary thing. The second thing with the flail is it circumvents the, the effect of moisture on the weed seed and it circumvents weed seed bounce. So the flail is going to wipe the inside screen and it's going to crush, grind and shear anything that gets in that gap, which is your weed seed effectively. So its kill rate is unaffected by the amount of material you put through it and um, the amount of moisture that's in that material. Okay. And just on like keeping the weed seed sort of in the, the chaff section to get there, we've sort of talked about it, for, yeah. So the biggest, the biggest challenge that, that we all have, so we've talked lots and lots today about getting separation and, um, and reducing sieve loadings, okay? Go, go and put a weed seed mill of any manufacturer's brand on the back of a harvester that's not set up in the right way and you are in a world of pain. So we go in here and put a divider in there. As soon as you start playing around inside there, you mess with the airflow. And as soon as you mess with the airflow, you can have all sorts of dramatic effects that are largely undesirable. Okay. So that's the challenge. So the last, the last five years, that's primarily what I've spent my time trying to do, trying to get that baffling right, get it in the right position for all of the different brands and machines that we fit terminators to. Um, and, and make all of that stuff work. So that primarily that was my, my job role. Right. Right. In terms of, you mentioned the baffle, yeah. um, with that baffle, the same, with, with all the harvest weed seed control systems, they need a baffle for that separation. So can you give us a comment on that? So understand what we're talking about. So the machines we've spoken mostly about today are what we would call an open separator. So there is no clear division between chaff and straw at the back of the machine. The one, the one different machine is the Lexian. Um, and look, the ideal is the same. It has a clear, 
defined definition between chaff and straw. So the two streams never, never see each other. Our challenge here with an open separator is you can get straw out of your rotor and land it on your sieve. And as soon as you do that, this has got to process the straw. And the enemy of all of the weed mills is straw. So think about what it's trying to do. It's trying to get small seed and smash it up and turn it into dust. And I go and put pieces of straw this long and I've got to turn them into dust. So it adds loading and it's that loading that causes most of the problems. So for us. Okay. They, they apply to the other systems, whether I've got chaff decks Correct. or whether I'm uh, chaff lining, I've got to have a back and we going to do that. And the other element which you've talked about earlier, which is the residue management, I really want that straw spread. Correct. And you want to be able to do that with whatever comes out of your mill as well. So, yeah. so it's worth probably mentioning at that yeah. stage, we were talking about the cost before yeah. Yeah, of the respective systems. It's not just the capital outlay and the running costs as well. There's a nutrient uh, yeah. factor yeah. In, in that cost as well, yeah? yeah. So especially chaff lining, chaff decking, which are gonna, is going to concentrate the chaff into a single sort of area in the paddock rather than spread it out evenly. Um, there's a cost of all that nutrient not being spread out into the rest of the paddock and concentrated. So um, it's sort of stepped through on the calculator, but if you use updated um, fertilizer prices, um, nitrogen's the main one you're sort of tying up and potassium as well. Um, we add a, a dollar value per hectare of not distributing that nutrient out evenly to the rest of the paddock and just concentrating it. Um, the same with um, a chaff cart which removes it, um, narrow windrow burning as well. So it's all on there. So rough costs, I guess, um, the higher the, the nutrient and fertiliser prices, the higher the, um, the cost is per hectare for the harvest weed seed control tools that do um, tie up the nutrient or concentrate it in one spot. So um, yeah, it's roughly sort of $30 a hectare for um, chaff lining with yeah, all the costs added up, which does include um, the nutrient tie up of uh, potassium and nitrogen. Um, similar for chaff decking, um, which also works out to be roughly the same um, for the, the weed seed impact mills, depending on the environment, size of the farm, um, reduced capacity, extra fuel costs and those sort of things. But we sort of we did say ballpark about $25 a hectare, but sort of in this region, it might be more like towards $35 a hectare um, once you add up all the costs. And obviously with the weed seed impact mills, there's no cost of nutrients because they're getting blown back um, out into the paddock. So yeah, nutrient um, tie up is, a, is one consideration of um, some of the, the harvest weed seed control tools. There's a guy yesterday who spoke and he's been doing windrow burning and he said, all the crop on either side of the burnt windrows is lodged and where the windrows are has stood up and that would be because of potassium in those plants. But by cell, for, uh, for cell structure, potassium is critical. So those plants in the rows are, have got all the potassium so they're holding up straight yeah. and everything else is lodging because it's lacking potassium from that's been spread out. Yeah, that's right. And it, yeah, it can be used as a bit of indicator of deficiency that might be over the rest of the paddock um, as well if you're, you're tying it up. Um, but yeah, we're probably keen to hear from some of you guys that are utilising a, a tool. There was one over here. Yeah. Yep. What, do you want to know? what what tool are you using? How? Yeah. This is your header. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Cool. How long have you had it on? This is where it's full of here. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And all crop types. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Pros, cons. Are you noticing any? Uh, it took a lot of horsepower, so we had to up the horsepower in the machine. Um, doesn't like grain stuff at yep. all. Will not handle any grain. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, does a good job. Makes a lot of dust. I know that. Yeah. And uh, seems to be doing a good job on the grass that it's getting. Yeah. You lose a lot of grass in the front too. Unless you're going to windrow all your crops, you're going to get knife loss for wild grass and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, I guess generally, like the bigger the crop, um, the more competitive a crop is. The ryegrass tends to stand up a, a bit better. Are you finding that? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is sort of, yeah, one thing, sort of crop competition and, and getting the ryegrass up into the canopy certainly helps. Just on the green material, like, what are you doing to deal with that? 
Oh, <laughs> to try and minimise the green in there. Yeah. Well, there's some places you can't do it. Like you've got a swampy area that yeah. you've sown through, you're going to end up with green stuff in there. So yeah. you either harvest around it and slash it or mulch it out or yeah. go really, really, really slow. Yeah. Have you um, tried the high capacity mills, the more open? Yeah. I reckon. Don't yeah. know? No, no. That's the standard one. Oh. And you've got the new one. You can have very small ones in it. Yeah. And they changed, so that's the new one, the newer mills are high oh, capacity ones. Yeah. Yeah. This mill was manufactured in 2018, so it would have had a, a, a 2018 style screen, which had half the size hole, once the guys bought the screen, yeah. So that's the current standard screen, a 2019 or 2019 yeah. screen. Um, the high capacity screens have no third cage. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about green material for 20 seconds. You go and pull a ryegrass plant out, put it on a block of wood and hit it with a hammer. First time you hit it, it sort of cracks a little bit. The second time you hit it, it sort of starts to splatter. But when you hit it the third time, it just turns to absolute pulp and goes everywhere. That's the one that glues the screen up and blocks the outer screen and blocks the mill. Uh, doesn't matter. Every, everyone's mill does the same thing. We take the screen out, which is a 15 or 20 minute process. That screen has no third yeah. um, stationary element, and it will. Yep, thank you. Right. Basically, it's the two these two stationaries with the two rows of rotating elements. This one is effectively a hole. By removing that, it allows the rotor to actually eject the green material, and it'll handle about thirty times the amount of green. So. Um, we saw them in the south of Western Australia last year. We, it was unharvestable without it. And so we're harvesting a four-ton barley crop, which was just below my knee height, and the ryegrass was just above my knee. Paddock was green. They go 50 feet, and these would be blocked. We put high-capacity screens in it. They finish the harvest with them. So... And I suppose the only... only the, the price you pay, obviously, is, is a reduced kill through the mill. Uh, so that's 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 the only price you should be paying, um, and I should add that, and I don't know if we mentioned it, but but um, Sam Trengo just uh, just about finished some work where they have compared all the different mill manufacturers' mills uh, on a standard tent, test bench, and kudos to all the manufacturers, they all got on board with that testing uh, in collaboration with Weed Smart and and ourselves. We made sure that you know that the, the, uh, the test protocol we we're working with was ratified. And was appropriate and all the mills have been through that process and we'll, we'll see some data for all sorts of weed seeds coming through that so stand by there'll be a few weeks away i imagine but um it'll be pretty interesting i think and it includes the high capacity mills and uh from from both manufacturers and, and also um uh, uh some worn mills uh work as well because there is a question about whether efficacy drops off um as the mill wears and so we'll have some answers to those questions as well is anybody running an IHS too? Oh, I haven't been driving that header since the first one that went on it, but yeah, I think it struggles in the green still. Yeah, so, yeah. And as Brett said, they all will. Um, it's universally uh, a challenge, but there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, yeah. One thing we've been working really hard on is to try and get farmers to start. We are literally the final process in your whole year. So there's so much that can happen forward of the mill of any of the brands before you get there with a header. So we want farms to start thinking about what to do to try and make things work better at harvest time. And the key point is, and it's green material, but it's moisture and, dry, and, and trying to dry that plant out. So most, a lot of my customers are on the York Peninsula and we're getting a lot of problems uh, dealing with green lentils is the big one up there. So we really encourage a lot of our customers to double knock their green lentils. So that's um, you know, at before harvest, it's hitting it with, a, say, a roundup and a paraquat, and so you dry that plant out from the top to bottom. So if you just hit it with a paraquat, you'll just burn the top off, especially in a big ear like this, and it will all be green underneath, and we'll have to deal with that material. So you hit it with a roundup and a paraquat, it will dry it from top to bottom. And then I think someone said it before, or with, with wind rowing, wind rowing is also something like a really good tool to try and dry your whole plant out, so it will process a bit better, and also really, really good for capture. So my best results with customers are guys in York Peninsula. They were traditionally wind rowing for shedding because it's windy on the peninsula. Um, now they're doing it for that, but also to try and maximise their harvest weed seed control. So um, 
so they can get the most amount of plants going into the mills and into those rows so we can increase our kill. And we touched on like, I think one of the figures is on ryegrass, if you've got a crop ready to harvest on day one, every day after day one that that crop's ready to harvest, you're losing 1% of your ryegrass seeds to shedding. So after 10 days from optimum harvest time, you've effectively lost 10% of your potential capture. So anything we can do to try and maximise that capture and get those, and windrowing is basically, in my opinion, the best tool, um, is it will get the best results from the mills. So a lot of my customers, if they really want to hit it hard, I'll do like two years of windrow barley and then a year of uh, lentils. And with lentils, obviously, you're on the ground, you get maximum capture as well. So anything we can do to feed it in the world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's like part of the whole system, really. So yeah, yeah, we sort of don't, rely on it as a, a silver bullet but integrating as many of the tools together and, and setting crops up for harvest weed seed control is pretty important. Can you guys talk about the results you're seeing? I mean that's what we're trying to talk about, the end game I guess. Do you want to, like on all brands, how are you guys seeing it in the paddock I guess, the agronomy side of it? Uh, it's obviously a, a, a slow process because um, I guess our biggest drama is we have, as all of these growers here find that we got wet patches in the paddock and you can have 80% of your paddock virtually weed free, but those wet patches are, you know, it's just out of control. And, and we're getting to the point now where those other areas are pretty much weed free and the wet patches are getting, the areas are getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, no, excellent. That's really useful, I reckon. Yeah, um, but yeah, definitely part of a, a systems approach and, and focusing on um, yeah, weed seed capture sort of right from the um, getting in the front, um, crop competition and, and narrow rows and those sort of things certainly help. Um, and then, yeah, I guess maximising what, what comes out the, the back and, and off the sieves as well um, for any tool. Um, and yeah, happy to discuss a bit further with anyone. Just a question, I guess, to maybe Ben can help here. What, what's, what we got cost or what levels are to to replace the place or the a little bit of a uh, run around. I think uh, from a, a red crop perspective, the SEU, you're looking about 120 grand and I'd say uh, roughly $20,000 was the was the discussion yesterday for, for mills. Um, that's for a full set. Um, they can be swapped over or uh, side to side uh, to try and get a little bit more wear out of those. Um, obviously integrating the John Deere system and, and uh, also through the canvas, so it comes up on your main screen. So um, that's the uh, SCU. But Mark, you want to just talk about uh, cost of the terminator and, yeah. and uh, availability and, and maybe mill costs as well? Yeah, I might just quickly touch, and I think we all, you know, all the brands suffer from it. I might quickly touch on mill wear and where the big variation is. That just so. Yeah. One of the, the killers for you know wearing out componentry, and I was been speaking with Andrew a bit about it, and we sort of see similar things. I think it's fair to say, like our worst areas for mill wear are say in the so from my end from South Australia's perspective is in the Mallee when you're on sandy soils and you're growing lentils and you're drawing a lot of sand through the front of the header, and that sand's ultimately ending up in the mill, and you're basically sand blasting the steel. So that's probably one of our worst areas, and we might for a set of screens, which is the piece Brett showed before. You know, we might get 350 rotor hours out of a set of screens. And then we jump across to Maitland on the York Peninsula. We're growing just as many lentils, but we're in a heavier soil type. We're getting up to 1,000 hours out, to, out of a set of screens. And then, you know, Brett had a customer in WA got nearly 1,700 hours out of No, 17, 1746. Now he was just doing cereals up off the ground. And then, like, down here, I mean, these guys were running the original screens from 2018 that just doesn't wear in this area. Like, they just last ages down here. So that's a really, you know, a lot of people ask about what's the cost per hectare. It's, it's, just, it's such a hard number to yeah. put a number on. Um, so in terms of um, purchase price, depending on the model, we're $110,000 to $120,000 roughly. And then uh, wearing components. So you've got three main wearing components, screens, rotors and flails. Your screens are your stationary part, your rotors, your internal parts that are moving. Screens are $6,000 for a replacement set of screens and rotors are about $9,000 and we wear them out roughly on a ratio of two to one. So if you, you wear out two sets of screens to one set of rotors. Um, so yeah, depending on how what your wear is, that'll give you a timeline in terms of your cost per year of production. So yeah. And availability, we have availability for machines for this year if everyone's keen.
Scott? So we have a similar arrangement, obviously being an impact mill, we call instead of a screen, a stator, a um, couple of different, different variations in that on flow. Um, so we look at, we generally wear a rotor out quicker than a stator, um, opposite to C-terminator. So but a complete mill set, stator and a rotor and a fan is about 10 and a half grand. Um, we see same different variants, um, lentil and looping guys out of Jero's must be our worst area for wear, high silica sands. Um, so yeah, no wear down here pretty much. Um, so availability, we manufacture everything in house, except for our belts and some bearings, so you can always make more. Um, and um, cost is John Deere is about 85,000, up to a Lexan's about 115. The CNH case, New Holland's is about 90 to 94. Yeah. And that's fitted or? Uh, plus plus fitted. fitted, yeah. And that's the same, with Mark, the pricing is including uh, fitting. Yeah, that's right. So that's your dairy outlay cost. So you've got to allow some additional cost for fitting there as well. Yeah. So that's I great. Both machines will be every couple of days. To fit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I understand there's some work going on um, around the ability to lift them out of the way, lift seed mills out of the way and things like put them down when you've got to go through a weed patch, things like that. Is Where, where are we at with that kind of technology? Uh, there's bits and pieces happening in that area. It's uh, not for, for our product, we're not in uh, commercial. For our John Deere product, we've got a bypass, same C terminator. Um, for CNH, that's not commercially at this point. Do you want to just describe the bypass a little bit more? So, it, a bypass mill or a, a, just a bypass it, keep it on, but just bypass where the, the material goes? Yeah, so in the John Deere, um, I think you guys are the same, it's pretty much a door drops down, set of bob coming into the mill, it'll go into your chopper. Um, you're right, you guys take your mills off, make them a little spinner. Um, we're working on where we actually bypass and put it in on a case into our spreader system. Yeah. So similar to what it normally would work in a normal operation. Yeah. And when you're doing loss measurement, harvest loss measurement, what's, what's do you suggest to customers they do? Uh, I just do, you take the back door off. Uh, there's a bypass tray to go in and drop it out into the window. Um, Ideally, is what for an IHSD because it, you can still pull material into your mills. It's yeah. just looking for that change. As long as you, whatever you're measuring, you, you're doing uh, a change and you're seeing a decrease in your grain loss. So it's kind of like a benchmark and then just keep measuring against it. Yeah. yeah. What about the uh, seed terminator? What are you suggesting for that, Brett? Um, so, with the case, uh, remove the info shoots leave everything else in place, uh, put your black grain tray back on the back, go do your loss test. Uh, if you want a full bypass, take the drive belt off, remove the exhaust chutes as well, black grain tray, you can put the chopper, or the spreader back into its original position, um, so it's a full bypass. Uh, New Holland and Class, we don't actually have a bypass method so to do any testing or anything what we recommend is that you remove the right hand mill screen so take the shoot off uh, take the um, info shoot off take the right hand mill screen out put it back together go do your test measure it two meters outside the exhaust on the right hand side um, it's it's not the best way but it doesn't affect the baffle, it doesn't affect your airflow as much as bypassing it all together and taking the baffle out, so. Sure. We have the bypass grains for the twin rotors as well, if they want to just harvest yeah. and not affect the header, that's the other option. Yeah. And that bypass screen is designed so that you don't damage the actual exhaust chute, um, because once you take the outside screen out, this exhaust chute cops all of the impact, so, um, it can damage the screen if you end up putting sand through your mill or something. Um, that uh, The idea of the bypass screen is it actually in, in, interrupts that airflow slightly, um, but protects the protects the housing. So, yeah. But it, it's not so bad purely because you can do that whole process in the space of 15 minutes. So it'd be ideal if it was a, you know, a two minute thing. The hard part is, you know, we've talked about it for, the whole time I've ever known Nick, 
we need to be able to put something in there to grab a sample so that you can actually measure it. But how do you then quantify what that the area that that sample relates to? That's that's the impossible part of it because you know we we can easily put something in there that grabs a sample, but but you can't equate it to a definitive loss. Mm. Mm. Watch this space. Yeah, yeah. watch this space. Yeah. Something will happen. Yeah, because it, it sort of could be relative to then you, you adjust a setting and then if it's... Yeah, you know, the only thing you'll do is it'll give you a number. You'll go and say, in that given sample, I yeah. had X amount of grain. Yeah. Right? And then you go, is that an acceptable amount or not? Well, hang on a minute. I'll change a couple of things and I'll see if that number goes down yeah. or up. Yeah. And then go, oh, okay, maybe I was happy with what I had. Yeah. You just don't know what percent. You, you don't know what percent loss. You don't know what it. No, because it's not being yeah. spread or it's not being windrowed into a given area, and so you can't quantify it. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, that's always been the challenge. Yeah. So. Great. Any but questions? Ju just remember, everything that you do with harvest weed seed control does involve some form of compromise, and going and doing this will teach you way more about your harvester than anything else you're ever going to do. Um, and it can be very painful. Mill manufacturers know that. Um, but, yeah, and how do you make the choice? Do your homework. Understand what's going to work for you and buy what you can get serviced. The other thing you keep saying also is about rotor loss. If you've got rotor loss... If you've got rotor loss... You got harvest weed seed going with it, so potentially, and you know, to be brutally honest, um, one of the one of the manufacturers did a lot of their testing in an area where I spend a lot of my time, where I own a house, and you can still see what's going on out in the paddocks, and it tells you that those machines that they were testing on had road loss. Mm -hmm. You you can see it in the paddock. Okay. So. And look, just to add to that, in terms of um, information, the Weed Smart website has a copy of a Condition Group report where we looked at all the mills. We spoke to a lot of different owners. We got some fuel use numbers, um, and there's some pretty, you know, mill manufacturers were asked some pretty candid questions, and, and they all answered them. They're all printed there verbatim. So go and grab a copy of that report if you're looking at mills at any stage. It's worth a read. Anything you want to ask on harvest weed seed control? I've got, can, I add, add, here, so can I add one thing, one, one advice I would give if you are looking at any of this technology is to talk to someone with the same sort of header as you have. All, as we've touched on today, all the headers perform differently, so there's no point you, if you're a John Deere person talking to a New Holland person, you've got to talk to someone who's got the same brand because they are all very different. So you've got to really get your head around that. Oh, it's really to critical. add to that, preferably in your area. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you know, this is why we can also grab and see what they're doing. And that's why we keep telling you, and I'll say it again, share it on that harvest loss and you'll find out what's going on. Mm. The hard part about all of this is finding a guinea pig in each area who's prepared to put their hand in their pocket and go and and be a guinea pig, literally. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Even if it's not the direct area, like, yeah, Somewhere. nearby. Yeah, some yeah and you can ask us, places. like the Weed Smart team's got a yeah. Yeah, pretty big reach sort of, um, across the country, sort of have an idea of what some yeah, people are doing. Yes. And I've, I've had lots of people who said to me, oh, I didn't know that, that was going to be like that. I thought you guys would have had all of that sorted by now. Mm -hmm. And you just go, do you know what? We're probably five years into a 50 year learning curve. Um, and I don't think any of the manufacturers have got all the answers. I'm certain they haven't. Um, and I'm certain there are going to be challenges that we haven't seen yet. That are going to come up, you know. We'll 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 go three steps forward and one step backwards sometimes. So um, that that's the challenging part. But yes, the only thing I was going to say they're only as good as what we were talking about before. Um, I think Mark said about the percentages that you know, drops out. It's only as good as what you can get in the header. If you can't get in the header, they don't do anything. So it has to actually go in there to work. So that, that's one of the big problems down here where. Our harvest gets later and later and later if we get rain and everything just yeah. starts to fall on the ground and you can't do anything about it, it's too late. Yeah, that 1% a day shedding, yeah. yeah. Yeah, plus you've got the lodgings, you can't, it's all lying down. How do I get, we talk about lifters and other things yeah. earlier. But you're right, you've got to get it in front.